I've been getting a lot of requests to do videos that have more of like tactics and tackle and things like that. I did a little bit of that on a video last year that showed you some uh, of my jigging tackle and the gear that we were using for jigging yellowfin. So I thought I would take an opportunity on a rainy 45 degree March day to show you a little bit about how we rig for topwater tuna. So this video is going to cover tactics and tackle for topwater tuna based out of the New York and New Jersey area. This video is going to cover the size class of fish that we typically see here in the New York and New Jersey area. So you're talking bluefin from 50 to maybe 150 pounds and yellowfin in that 50 to 100 pound class. Now by no means is this the only way to do it. I have my own methods, you have your own methods. You might just still be learning. You might be very experienced. Whatever level of angler that you are, maybe there'll be one or two things that you can take out of this video that'll help you on your next trip offshore. So the first thing we're gonna cover is trying to find these fish. How do you find them? It's a big ocean out there. So you wanna be looking for signs of life. To start out, you're looking ideally for mammals. Whales, when you find whales feeding, if there's enough bait for whales, there's enough bait for tuna. And a lot of times these fish will be mixed right in with the mammals. Now we'll get into the differences between a whale feed and a porpoise feed, but generally if you have mammals in the area, that's a great sign. The other thing you wanna be focused on are birds. There's all different types of birds offshore, from seagulls to shearwaters to little terns to storm petrels but they all have a different meaning and a different way of analyzing what's going on under the surface. So to start out, shearwaters are a great sign. Shearwaters tend to be in the same area. They're low flying birds that'll cruise around and they'll be looking for the same thing you're looking for, bait, fish oil, fish feeding. Generally, if there's a large group of shearwaters sitting on the surface and they all have their heads in the water and they're looking down, there recently was a feed there, or there's actually fish underneath them. Remember, these birds have the ability to be up above everything. They're like their own little drone or airplane up there that they could see down into the water and they know exactly what's going on. A lot of times you'll see a bird swooping down and then all of a sudden a fish will come up underneath it. It's because they saw that fish, they knew what was going on. So being able to keep your eyes on birds and analyzing their movements will cause you to have a lot more success offshore. So the one downside of shearwaters are they love to grab your lures. So whenever there's a lot of shearwaters around, throwing poppers, throwing floating stick baits can be really tough when you deal with the shearwaters. Uh, you tuna fish for any length of time and you're going to get experience with unhooking shearwaters. So the other bird that we see a lot of are storm petrels, or we call them tuna chicks very small little birds. They just kind of float along the surface, almost like they're just hovering. And what they're doing is they're feeding on the oils and little fragments from the feed coming up from the depths. So whenever you see tuna chicks, a lot of times you'll also see the slicks on the surface. So just like I said, the tuna chicks can be on a slick. You want to keep a lookout for slicks. There'll be flat spots in the water. The oils from the fish will actually, actually smooth the seas out and will cause a large flat spot in the water. Now slicks are a great sign because obviously fish were just there feeding. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that that slick is right over where the fish were. It could drift with the current. It could come down from someplace where they're feeding very deep, but you'll often get that watermelon or like fresh cut grass or cucumber smell. And uh, every tuna fisherman loves smelling that because it's the oils being released from sand eels and other fish that are being eaten. And it means that there's been a fresh feed going on in the area. In terms of bait that you're looking for, Great things to see are big shoals of sand eels on the surface. A lot of times our fish in the New York, New Jersey fishery are on sand eels. So you find those concentrations of bait, you find whales working them. If there's enough bait for whales, there's plenty of bait for tuna to be there. A lot of times they're all mixed in together. So slow the boat down, take a look, look at your machine, start working the area and see what you can see. Later in the summer, you might get schools of skipjack on the surface. 
And you might just think, oh, it's just a school of skippies. Nine times out of 10, the yellowfin are mixed right in with the skippies. And you throw a popper into that school, you might think it's all a little skipjack, and then a 75 pound yellowfin comes out and explodes on the popper. Happens all the time. So when you're on the lookout for all these things, a great thing to have are a good set of binoculars. Now you don't necessarily need to have the gyro stabilized binoculars. They come in handy, but they're very expensive. Uh, as a duck hunter, I actually bring my hunting binoculars out with me. I don't have gyro stabilized ones. I just have a nice set of hunting binoculars. And when you're out there, you can stop the boat, you can look around, you can see what you could see. And it's just better to, if you see those whale spouts on the horizon, you can go and investigate that. If you see a little group of tuna chicks, you know, more clustered together. Uh, in the 2020 triple rex bite, it really helped us get on to the more active uh, groups of yellowfin by using the binoculars, scanning the horizon, and seeing where the most active groups of tuna chicks were, and then making our way over there to start throwing bait. Another factor you have to think about are other boats. So there's gonna be other boats out in the area fishing, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that group of boats you see over there are on fish. I've seen it a million times where a boat just stops for any old reason. Maybe someone has to use the bathroom after a long ride out, but one boat stops, another boat stops, another boat stops, and it turns out it's just boats attracting boats. They're not actually on anything, and you're just gonna contribute to the problem by being on top of them. So it's always good to keep an eye on what other people are doing, but you're out there fishing for yourself, don't be too worried about other people, what other people are doing. It's always good to find your own fish and sometimes staying out of the crowd is the best way to do that. Now, when it comes to fishing in a crowd, it's gonna happen, it's unavoidable. We're fishing off some of the most populated states in the union. As we all know, information is paramount these days and also, I don't think secrets really exist anymore. Between the internet, social media, information networks, uh, your uncle's brother's girlfriend knows a guy who did this or that, information gets out there. So you're gonna end up fishing in a crowd sometimes. Now it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to do it all the time, but it's going to happen. So let's say you just finished a two hour run offshore. It's a really hot bite. The fish have been condensed in the same area for a long period of time. Everyone knows about it. Shackle shop, Instagram, Facebook, everybody's there. You still want to try to have respect for everyone else. So when you're coming in, don't come in, you know, full throttle, bearing down. I got to get into the tightest part of, you know, all these other boats. Just back it down at a respectable distance. Be respectful for all the other captains that were out there before you. You know, if you're the first boat on the grounds, great. You know, some guys leave the night before. Some guys don't come back in so they could be out there by themselves. You need to decide what's best for you and your schedule. But chances are you're not going to be the first boat on the grounds. So be respectful of everyone else. Be respectful of the charter captains that are doing this for a living. Be respectful for the commercial guys that might be out there. So slow down. Take a minute to analyze everything that's going on around you and then figure out how you want to approach, you know, the life that's out there, you know, if there's feeds going on, mammals, anything like that. A lot of times the fish are on the outskirts of a fleet. By just going full bore and running straight into the rest of the boats, you're missing out on opportunities. I don't know how many times you've had situations where we just stay away from the fleet all day and we find our own fish and we might be in sight of other guys fishing and people are running right past us full throttle and we're hooked up, but they wanna to get to that group of boats over there. Just take a minute, analyze the situation, always be aware of your surroundings. That's a great tip to take. When you're fishing offshore like this, you always want to have buddy boats with you. So when we go out, we'll have friends that we keep in touch with on the VHF, keep in touch with on the Garmin inReach, and everyone can kind of work together. And therefore you might be a couple miles off where there's a hot bite. And if you have a good Intel network and a good group of friends, you can clue each other in on what's going on. And then you can all work together to get on fish. Now it takes time. It's not going to happen overnight. You know, there's pay services you can get into that'll really cut down on, you know, the time it takes to make your own networks and build your own relationships. But regardless of what path you take to get there, it's going to take time and you're going to want to have good give and take relationships. 
you know, information doesn't necessarily come freely. Uh, there's a lot of respect you want to have for guys that fish a lot more than you do. I know with my work schedule, I do not fish nearly as much as a lot of other people. So I try to be respectful of any of information that's given to me uh, from guys that fish all the time, whether it be a charter person or whatever, or commercial guy or whatever else. So be respectful in all aspects of the game from information sharing down to how you approach a fleet down to how you approach other boats running in and out. So let's say it's the perfect scenario. You're all by yourself. You've found a group of fish up on the surface. Now what? It's all about boat positioning. So the first thing you need to do is figure out what is this school of tuna doing? Are they actively feeding? Are they pushing water? Are they milling in a circle on the surface? Figuring out what the fish are actually doing is the first step you need to do. If it's a raging aggressive feed, you could fly over there you know, get up on them, start winging casts, and most likely you'll probably get tight. But if the fish are just pushing water or they're milling, it's a whole different situation. Not every school is the same. So once you've analyzed what they're doing, you then want to analyze what direction they're going in. So tuna do not feed from their tails. They feed, obviously, from their mouths. So you want to approach them from their head. If you come in behind a school of fish and you're casting at their tails, you might get bit, but chances are you're gonna spook them coming up from behind or they're just gonna not even see your lure and keep going. You wanna analyze how that school is moving and move your boat to come around it so you can fire casts up ahead of that school as if it's chasing your lures that you're throwing. This is a huge tactic to use when the fish are on porpoise schools. The yellowfin love to get in these porpoise schools. Even if you don't think the porpoise are feeding and they're just like doing their greyhounding across the surface, a lot of times there's fish mixed in with them. We've had situations where you have a large school of porpoise moving fast in one direction and we can get out ahead of them and kind of cut them off at the pass and get cast into the leading edge of that school and get bites. It doesn't happen all the time, but it's happened enough that it's kind of a trend. Now, something else you need to consider is when you're throwing this heavy gear, it's not the same as just whipping around a little bass rod or a sea bass rod or something like that. This stuff is heavy, it's a longer rod, it's heavy plugs, you're throwing big treble hooks, so you need to be able to set up to cast downwind. You can cast straight into the wind, but with the braid and other types of super lines you're using, you're going to end up having wind knots. When you, if you can set the boat up to cast downwind, you're going to have a lot less wind knots and you're gonna be able to actually cast farther if you need to. Once you've figured out which way the school is moving, now you need to figure out which way the wind is blowing and you can move the boat to be able to get your anglers to cast downwind into the leading edge of the school to get the best presentation to get a bite. Again, some days a fish are raging feeding, they're stupid, and none of this is going to matter. But it's something that you really need to take into account on those tricky days where you're trying to get a bite. One thing to consider even before you leave the dock is how experienced is your crew? How experienced are the anglers you have on your boat that day at throwing these heavy popping rods? This is not the same as just going out and casting plugs for bass or using light gear for sea bass or largemouth. These are heavy popping rods with big reels, big plugs with big treble hooks. It can be very dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. So one thing I have on my boat, which I think everyone should consider doing, is I have it here in a vacuum sealed bag, is I have a set of bolt cutters that I keep on the boat in a vacuum sealed bag to keep it nice and clean and salt free specifically because we end up throwing these big plugs with big treble hooks and if something bad happens i want to have bolt cutters on the boat just in case now thank goodness we've never had to use these but harbor freight something cheap like this that you're using for one specific reason vacuum seal it to keep it out of the salt air I think it's a good insurance policy to have on the boat. So have a discussion with the crew on your boat. Understand what everyone's skill level is. 
I have plenty of very experienced people that fish with me on the boat. We've fished Cape Cod, we've fished North Carolina, we've fished multiple seasons here in New Jersey throwing heavy duty tack casting gear. But I have people on the boat, like my wife, much more comfortable using a jigging rod, is not that comfortable throwing these big popping rods. So she stays as a filmer behind us while we're doing all our casts. But when you're, in, when you're coming in on a frothing tuna feed, everyone's brains kind of go out the window. So you need to have people that can stay calm and you need to have some sort of order on the boat so you can make sense out of the chaos. So one thing that we always do is we designate who's gonna be the first person casting out of a line. And we'll set up a line of everyone casting on my boat. Maybe we'll have three people that are experienced and we kind of work it as like the casting circle. We're all right-handed, so you're starting on the right side of the boat. Someone goes up to the bow, they cast from right to left, and then they slide down the gunnel. So it just kind of works as a circle. So after the first person casts and they slide down the port side gunnel, the next person can come up to the bow and cast behind them and so on and so forth. And therefore you're never in the way. No one is behind someone trying to get leverage, throwing one of these big poppers with big treble hooks and no one's gonna catch a hook in the head. But again, it all comes down to your angler's experience and how comfortable they are using this type of tackle. All right, so everything you've been working for has happened. You're tight, you're hooked up. What do you do next? On my boat, I love to have the angler up in the bow, keeps them away from the motors, keeps them away from the trim tabs, anything like that. So we'll try to keep the angler up in the bow, but I wanna make sure that I can have eyes on them without anyone in between. So anyone that's helping you, people that are filming, we try to set it up so that I can have a clear line of sight to the angler in the bow and I can see that, that line angle coming off the rod. I need to know if that fish is charging the boat, which way it's going, and I can maneuver the boat, usually in reverse, to keep the angler in the bow and to keep the line angle right because it'll actually help you plane the fish up to the surface. These longer popping rods, it's really tough when the fish gets straight up and down. So you can actually back the boat off the fish, keeping the angler into the bow, and it'll change that angle of the line so you can make better progress of planing that fish up to the surface. We've caught a lot of big fish on light gear by using this technique. Communication is such an important part of this. We don't need to have music going. We don't need to have people yelling and screaming. I just want nice, calm, but clear communication between the angler, anyone that's up there helping them, and the driver of the boat to figure out, okay, what's the next move? Is the line going out? Is the line coming in? You never want to let that fish rest, or because even though you're catching your breath, that fish is catching its breath too. So being having good communication on the boat is paramount to be able to land these fish on light gear in a short amount of time. We've all seen a situation where people are tight on one of these fish, they're getting tired, and they're putting pulling the rod way up like this and high sticking it. These rods are not indestructible. They will explode when you get put them under too much drag at the wrong angle. So again, Keeping the angler up in the bow, backing the boat off the fish, reduces that line angle to keep that rod at a lower level so you're not coming way up and potentially breaking the fish off or breaking a rod. Of course, this really comes into factor when that fish is straight up and down in the end game. And this is why when it comes to belts, a lot of times we don't like using a belt when that fish gets straight up and down next to the boat. We could use a belt sometimes, you know, when the fish is out away from the boat a bit, but the second that you have this rod in a harness and you're trying to leverage it, you can't actually get the right leverage when it's this tight to the boat. If you don't have it in a belt, a lot of times you could put the rod under your arm and you can keep that leverage when the fish is working in its final spirals. So one big thing, on my boat, we actually don't have any egos. None of us are the expert angler that hooks the fish. I have to be on this fish for three hours because I'm the one that's gonna land it. It's all about me. No, there's no egos on the boat. Tuna fishing and big game fishing in general is a team sport. 
I don't care. You might have whatever thoughts or whatever, you know, rah, rah, rah. I'm the big, strong person catching the fish. On our boat, we really don't care. So if you're getting tired, the second anyone starts to feel tired, we rotate them out. Rotate someone else in on that rod. We're not going to end up losing the fish because you're exhausted and you do something that ends up messing it up. So rotate people in and out, rotate them out before they even get tired. And then you won't get into a situation where someone is exhausted at a critical time of the fight and they can't perform the way they need to. It's a team sport. At the end of the day, that fish is in the boat. We all caught that fish. Everyone gets the high five. The fish is in the boat. So we discussed not using a belt when the fish is straight up and down and in that final end game. Another thing you really need to consider is the drag level. Now you want to set your drag properly before you start casting. And then you need to kind of monitor it during the fight to figure out if you need to put a little bit more heat on the fish or back off. Now these reels, like in particular, like this Stella 14,000 can put out close to 50 pounds of drag. That's going to explode a rod like this. Not only that, but you're not going to be able to handle 50 pounds of drag on a popping rod. So one thing you need to consider is potentially keeping the drag a little bit lighter to protect your body and the equipment and then palming the spool to give it some extra drag. So you can actually use the palm of your hand to put a little bit of extra drag on the reel when you need it and then let go when you don't. So you're not in a situation where you're pinned and then the rod ends up breaking because you have too much drag on the equipment. Now let's get into the equipment a little bit. So when it comes to tackle for targeting tuna on top water, try saying that 10 times fast, there's all different budget levels. I have a couple examples here of from higher end to not so high end tackle. And I'll show you stuff that I use in the different situations and different size classes of fish that I use it for. So we'll start out with heavier tackle, larger fish, like 100 to 200 pound class. This is a salty water tackle Monster Ledge 200 ST paired with a Stella 14,000. So obviously very high end expensive setup but it's also relatively light in weight for casting all day but it can handle a larger fish so monster ledge 200 st paired with a stella 14,000. All my popping rods are spooled with Cortland C16 hollow core. Most of these 14,000s have 60 pound Cortland C16 on them. So this setup, pretty expensive, can handle a larger fish. Um, it has a larger foregrip for when you really need to get leverage and you're fighting that fish out here compared to the other ones. It is a little bit heavier than some of my other rods. So while it is still light in terms of popping rods, it is heavier than my other two. So when you're casting it all day, you do feel a little bit of a difference. This is my middle of the road weight rod and still you know, relatively up there in terms of expense. But this is my go-to setup for just about anything. We've caught fish from 70 inches to, you know, little schoolies on this setup, and they're all equally as fun. This is a salty water tackle El Maestro 77H, and I have a 14,000 Shimano Twin Power, again, spooled with Cortland C16 Hollow Core. These, this setup is light enough that you can cast it all day, and it doesn't really wear your shoulder out too bad. Um, and it can handle fish. Like I said, we've caught fish to just shy of 70 inches on one of these setups. For something a little bit more budget conscious, this is my smaller fish rod. So school blue fin, yellow fin, anything like that. And it's also a backup rod. This is a Jigging World Ghost Hunter 150. And I also have a 14,000 twin power. The 14,000 size reels have a high gear. You generally want a high gear reel for popping to be able to let you get up that slack in the line after your cast. But the Ghost Hunters rods are, are great off the shelf rods. They're, 
at least half the price of my other setups that I have. Uh, they could still, you know, handle a decent sized fish. But this is my lightest popping setup. It's really good for, you know, yellowfin, school bluefin, that sort of thing. But in terms of like a budgetary, you know, rod, this is a great option for you. Again, if you want to put, let's say, to save some more money, a Saragossa 14,000, they work great as well. In terms of lures that we're using, I have a couple of the most popular lures that we've used for bluefin and yellowfin the last few seasons here. So the number one most popular lure for I don't know how many years running now, and if you've been paying attention to anything, you've probably seen this, is the Frostbite White Mad Mantis Poppers. This is the, I believe it's the large size, it's not the extra large. And uh, these particular poppers, they work great. For whatever reason, they just love this frostbite white color, whether it looks like a squid or, or what it looks like, but these are just deadly. I have all my poppers rigged with BKK Raptor Z treble hooks. I believe these are three-aught trebles. They have a nice hook in them that seems to get into, the seems to hold really well when you get a solid hook up on the fish. But you definitely want to swap out any kind of terminal tackle on any poppers that you're using uh, unless they come rigged with like the BKKs or like owner ST76s or 66s. I like to put little motivational messages to the fish on them. So again, the Mad Mantis popper, this is another really productive color for us. Uh, this is good on the yellow fin. This is like kind of like a skipjack color. I think they call this Superman, this color. Uh, seems to work really well. Now when it comes time to throwing subsurface lures to fish. The popper bite is great, but sometimes between the birds or however the fish are acting, you know, you're not always going to get them on a popper. So again a couple different budget levels here this is a siren antidote 130 in butterfish it's thrown this in the fall when they're on smaller baits rigged again with the bkk single hooks uh, these for as small as they are they cast really well because they're heavy and they sink very nicely and vertically like that And that's the Siren Antidote 130, this butterfish color for a subsurface sinking lure. Again, to continue with the Siren, you have the Siren Deep Seductresses. These are two different sizes I like to use. This is like a bluefish color, and this is similar to like a sand eel or a bunker. Uh, these are great. You know, they're fast sinking when you're dealing with shearwaters and birds and things like that. You could throw these in, let them sink, get them down deep, and then work them back. Uh, these are not cheap by any means, and if these look like they haven't been used much, that's because they haven't, because I've been too afraid to actually throw them. But here's some Siren Deep Seductress. Again, gorgeous handcrafted lures made in Massachusetts. And then I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the soft plastics. Probably more fish have been caught on Ronzi's than anything else. Pink is always really good for whatever reason. Uh, and then the hoagie pro tails. Guys have caught giants on these things, 700 pound fish. It's really incredible how well these work, especially if, if the fish are picky, if they're on little butterfish, micro baits, they just kind of like to get this little tail. Sometimes they're just eating the tail. Um, but these are always super productive lures. You know, you could use them on a jigging rod, but you know, for casting the pink worm, Ronzi, and then the hoagie pro tails, paddle tails. I'm always going to have two rigged with mantis poppers and then one rigged with a subsurface lure of some type. This is another siren, or you could rig it with a pro tail or a Ronzi. And again, when it comes to rigging, I'm not using the standard hooks that come on mostly any of these poppers or, or rigs like that. I keep everything nicely organized, but I have all my hooks laid out here. You know, my 
have everything labeled and laid out. So my ST76s, my BKKs, if I have some pre-rig jigging hooks, assist hooks in here, the single hooks, BKK single hooks for some of the smaller lures. But you wanna keep everything nicely organized so you can keep it rust free and ready to be used at a moment's notice. A lot of people are wondering about leaders. So I said all these rods are spooled with Cortland C16 spliceable hollow core braid. So we splice loops into the end of it so you can do loop to loop. All three of these rods right now are set up with the salty water tackle style twisted leader system. The twisted leader system isn't necessarily for everyone. I even don't use it all the time. But what I'll do is I'll tie a bunch of twisty leaders up and have them set in Ziploc bags so I could use them at different times. Or another option are to use your own. I do make my own, but I do have some of these blue action tackle wind on leaders. The main thing is, is you just want to have any kind of knot outside of the guides when you're casting. So here's your twisted leader systems. If you're not that familiar with them, you have your spliced end loop goes into twisted monofilament. This is an old one, it has to get redone, but it's twisted monofilament, which goes down to a bulky knot, which is to your fluorocarbon bite leader, down to a barrel swivel or a ball bearing swivel to a split ring to your lure. When you're casting, this big knot stays outside the tip of your rod. So you're never casting anything bulky through the guides. This twisty will flow right through and then there's actually no knot here. It's just loop to loop, cat's ball. The other option is with a wind on leader, there's also no knot involved. You could do an FG knot, you could do a PR knot. It's really up to you. Um, I like the twisted leader system. They're easy to tie. But I also, in certain situations, I like using a wind-on leader. So at the end of the day, there's many different ways to put tuna in the boat. You know, I'll catch them any different way, whether it's trolling, bait, jigging, popping, it's all good to me. But having a little bit of knowledge and having the right casting gear can put you into a successful situation when you either run into fish on top or you encounter something when you're out there trolling or bait fishing. It's just something else to have in your bag of tricks to help you get more fish in the boat. And at the end of the day, we're just having fun out there, trying to enjoy a day or we're not at work or whatever else. So have fun, don't get frustrated, don't take it out on other people, and just have a good time. Now remember, if you can like, subscribe, if you have any other things you want me to discuss or anything you want me to show, we have a bunch of videos coming out. We're gonna be going through my 27 on slow bay, showing that off. We're gonna go through a bunch of other tactics we have, and maybe I'll even get some duck hunting footage out there.